This is something we've been talking about doing for some time, so it's great that we can make this happen. And uh, you know, I think really interesting to see what comes out of our discussions. Um, I, yeah, I, as, as you heard, I mean, the, one of the inspirations for this, or one of the ideas for this, was to kind of put put side by side some of the recent articles that we've been um, publishing. These programmatic types of argument uh, articles uh, about the field of migration studies or you know, going beyond migration studies as it is. And so there's an article that I published in GEMS that was circulated, and I'm also referring to a, a book uh, that's come out, The Integration Nation. Um, and um, I'm not, I don't propose to go through these points because you can, I actually gave this talk uh, at the other Max Planck Institute in Göttingen recently. You can actually go and see that or you can have a look at the GEMS article, or you can have a look at the book. Um, and I'm, I'm putting up a series of sort of, a, a sort of theoretical synthesis of the field that in many ways shadows a lot of what, what Nina's been presenting. I mean, there's obviously differences, but, um, uh, and I'm gonna talk in a little bit detail about the relationship of our work. Um, but, um, you know, we can, we, can, we can pick up this language or we can pick up, I think, preferably Nina's language maybe and focus on the Nina's discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, I can, I can kind of give you my take on this uh, in further discussion perhaps. Uh, and I'll just, just add there's, a, you know, there's sort of a, a bottom line of this, of course, which we can bring into this, the COVID-19 um, thing. But I wanted to talk more directly really as a commentary of, of Nina's work, as a way of ex explicating um, some of the, quite familiar theoretical ideas that are behind the work that I'm doing, which are reflecting the influence of recent critical migration studies. By this I mean stuff like Nick de Geneva, Sandra Mazadra's work, um, and, uh, and others um, that has emerged out of a newer generation that is perhaps not in so much in dialogue with the, the generation that I'm part of, which is a conventional kind of immigration uh, politics generation centered on um, people like Brubaker and Holyfield and Jopka, Saskia Sassen and, and earlier formations and so forth. And of course, on one side of that, Nina's work in anthropology and then sort of other, other sociologists. So. Um, now, you know, Nina's, Nina's work um, is, uh, is extremely important to me. And, and you know, I also, also feel that, um, you know, there's, there's I, I would just be rewording in, in many senses, I think, the kind of free w framework that she's, she's offering to us, so we can kind of focus there. And I, Nina's w written a, a series, uh, really, of very influential, I would say, manifestos um, for research on transnationalism migration studies over several, you know, a period of several decades, uh, often in co-authorship with people like Wimmer, Andres Wimmer, Peggy Levitt, Thomas Feist, um, Noel Salazar and Aisha Chala. Um, these are all kind of separate parts of a bigger picture, obviously, that we're kind of present, getting presented here. But all of these works individually have been extremely influential, you know, in terms of citations and, and debate. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and in many ways, I, you know, I, I would hope that my work is largely compatible with um, this sort of framework that Nina has presented, or indeed, in fact, shadows it and perhaps reworks it and comes back to it in ways that um, you know might be felt as just a, a sort of on, on a theoretical level, some sort of a, an add-on to it. By this, I mean um, that um, you know, as we've heard, I mean the the early, if you my my current book, if you like, is is a book about. Um, uh, the underlying structuring of conventional thinking in liberal democracies by effectively racial capitalism and by um, an ongoing kind of colonialism that's reflected in the ways in which we think about multiculturalism or integration or increasingly about, um, you know, mainstream debates uh, around um, uh, reactions to, you know, the limits of these things, limits of immigration, limits of integration and so forth. Um, uh, and as Nina, and it comes back to a position that, that, that in a sense, as, as Nina's stressing, takes us back to the work of you know, Nations Unbound and its, its obvious placing within a broader Marxist type of literature. And I'm fairly explicit in the book that it's a Marxist book. So um, in that sense, it's just coming back round to something that maybe was obvious 30 years ago that it's taken me that time to get there. Or, um, 
or you know that we we do still need this sort of agenda in other words um, and I think this is also reflecting very much the rediscovery of these sorts of things by you know by the younger generation by some of that you know by by Mizad, by by De Genova, Mizadra and company um, uh, and of course it also comes around very in a very similar way to emphasizing the the connected um, importance of global uh, tr and transnational social movements, um, Black Lives Matter, decolonial movements, the extinction movement, indigenous movements, uh, and migration movements, and you know the, the mobilisation of the precariat um, as really the way of thinking about a politics, you know, against the conventional nation-centred politics that, that's out there. Um, so you know, in then in many ways. Um, if you look at the, the things I've been writing, it, it echoes obvious parts of, of Nina's work. Um, uh, you know, I was also in the late 90s, early 2000s, writing about methodological nationalism. I didn't call it that. I called it the integration nation. But um, uh, integration nations, it basically is a critique of methodological nationalism. And you can just map those things out as, as a common kind of effort. Um, similarly, uh, there's this effort to try and work with ethnography and anthropology as a way of talking about globalization, the big macro questions, capitalism, globalization, institutions, global structures, et cetera, forth, but seen through the eyes, you know, seen through an ethnographic and anthropological lens. Um, I did work, the new face of global mobility was, of global mobilities was the work uh, that I did. I mean, I think for Nina's taste, a bit too close to Michael Peter Smith, perhaps, for, for comfort, but, um, but otherwise, um, I think very, you know, very much aligned with, with uh, her agenda. Uh, like Nina, um, since the 90s, uh, trying to incorporate obvious things out of geog what the way geographers think into sociology or anthropology. Um, geographers thinking about networks, thinking about scale. I think the language of displacement, dispossession, and the particular way of thinking about neoliberalism is hugely influenced by geographers. And a lot of this stuff in, in the ge geography is very obvious, uh, and it's just... You know, it's taken a long time to really come into the migration studies that other people are doing, um, including, I'd say, transnationalism. But Nina, I think, was was working from that for a long time. And I think the, the obvious illustration of this, um, particularly, I think, is this this wonderful book with Aisha Chala, um, you know, which is all about scale and displacement and looking looking at the ways in which localities and mobilizations at local levels, you know, are embedded in these broader scales. I think, as we also heard, that there's a very important discussion to be had in, uh, 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 about the relationship of Nina's work to Saskia Sassen's recent work and expulsions. I see these things as parallel, parallel kinds of projects, but I'd be interested to know a little bit where, where your differences lie with Saskia Sassen, because um, she's obviously been you know, hugely influential in, taking, in also taking this return to a sort of more Marxist-sounding analysis of global... Um, capitalist structures that are throwing up the you know throwing up migrations, throwing up dispossessions, throwing up um, precarities and uh, ongoing colonial sorts of processes. Um, and the other thing I think that's obviously common that we have is 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 a serious um, impact of the new generation, this new generation of, of thinkers. And what what I think of these new generations in a, in a very specific way, it's it's people of a certain age whose professional careers and work has been absolutely um, shaped by the fact of coming of age intellectually in, a ra in and around 2008 and afterwards. And you look at the world completely differently if you're in that generation, as opposed to being in my generation, which was impacted by 1989 and all that. So, of course, we had a gung-ho and celebratory kind of attitude towards the transnational, towards mobilities, towards the potential of globalization at that period because we were living the dream, as it were, of post-1989. And the, the, the 2008 generation just simply looks at it differently. 2089 was a disaster. It wasn't a great, um, a great moment in many ways. And, and we're living with those disasters, I think, now. Um, you know, um, and I, you know, I think that's what our theorizing is all about and where we ha what we have in common. Now, I want to j just go through some of the differences, nevertheless, that I think are distinctive about what I, I would be proposing. I mean, first of all, that there's this obvious thing that I spend a lot of my time engaging not with um, geographical and anthropological theory, but with mainstream sociologists, mainstream empirical 
sociology of immigration. Um, I've made myself persona non gratis, certainly in the American sociology field, for my continual critique of Richard Alba, which I think is, you know, I take Richard Alba really seriously because his work is incredibly influential on mainstream thinking about immigration, not in, only in North America, but also um, increasingly, you know, as a comparative framework, so the Alba Massey, Waters and Portes type of frameworks. Um, and also, um, you know, linked to this, the emergence of a mainstream sociology driven by quantitative scholars coming out of social stratification, um, studying integration, um, reproducing a lot of methodological nationalism, but really providing the, the entire technology for policy understandings of immigrant integration processes. Um, people like um, Anthony Heath uh, and, uh, um, is it Roger Kalter? Um, head of the, the Mannheim Center in Germany, um, you know, mainstream sociologists who the anthropologists simply don't in, engage with, I think. And I, I do try to engage with these people head on, even if uh, you know, what I have to say about them is generally ignored. Um, and I think there's also comparative policy work as well that's, that's, that's very powerful, that, that really shapes policy thinking um, in ways that are all about you know, imposing a certain sort of thinking about immigration, integration as a form of governance. I think linked to this also, I think that there's a relative lack in, in, in Nina's work when she presents it of, of, pol of political science as such. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, what's obvious or what doesn't, doesn't have to be seen as a lack, but in terms of what drives me is, is a relationship to conventional political science as such, institutional political science, the way it thinks about how um, democracy works, how institutions work, and particularly the normative question that polit drives political science, obviously, of, of understanding the power of democracy or the power of sovereignty, uh, which is why the nation remains an absolutely fundamental category for me and why, why, why theorizing the state and where the power of the state comes from in normative terms is, is so central to the, to the book and to, to, to the project that I've got. So it's, it's, it's a, a project about... Um, uh, in quite, quite conventional terms of, of thinking about, uh, about the ways in which um, nation states govern immigration, um, particularly, I think, through sovereignty and the, and the magic of democracy, you know, the fact that we're unable to challenge uh, an outcome that is driven by 52% of the population voting to do something, which is you know, what is driving a lot of politics these days, including you know, obvious things like Brexit, Brexit at the heart of, of what I have to say. Uh, why it's important, I think, um, and why we have to step out of, you know, why we would indeed need critiques of liberal democracy. You know, all of this stuff is being reproduced in, in our mainstream defense of um, democracy as a term and also, you know, the, the sort of rights-based thinking, which is characteristic of liberalism, human rights-based thinking as well. Um, and, um, and finally, I think there's this, this sort of in aspect of my work, which is, we, which is wrestling a bit more seriously, I think, with the, the issue, you know, some issues of operationalization in quantitative terms. Um, uh, and, and I've spent most of the year this year trying to turn my manifesto, the, the, the GEMS article and, or the book, both of these are really manifestos, into a kind of operational project um, and what that might be. And I, I hook the work there very much, therefore, directly to, you know, when we talk about global dispossession or global inequality, there is an empirical literature on global inequalities that is very specific about how to measure global inequality in relation to, for example, um, uh, the value of passports um, and um, you know, other issues to do with um, the explanatory power, obviously, of, of where you were born being determinate in your actual life chances on a global scale. So the, the literature from Milanovic and Piketty uh, and so forth, it are providing these rather clunky sorts of indexes, but which are nevertheless capturing something, I think, that is fundamental to our thinking in migration studies, which is, you know, why, you know, why, why is that migration, mobility, and so forth is so important? It's because it's one of the fundamental mechanisms that changes the global order, order of inequality, or to put it another way, why the pres preservation of <coughs> national sovereignty through models of citizenship and integration is a way in which the dominant um, North Atlantic West states in the world maintain where they sit at the hierarchy of global citizenship um, indexes. Um, 
you know, why, you know, why, in other words, um, being born in um, Eritrea um, means something in relation to being born in, in Germany or, or, or wherever. You know. um, and, and so I'm trying, to rest, I'm trying to use that sort of literature to try and operationalize this kind of um, work, which is about um, you know, the birthright lottery um, and what, something that is, is at the fundamental heart of racial capitalism, which is the order of national citizenships internationally and, and what that means. Um, and then there's the issue of trying to do mobility's work. So the other, the other key mechanism in the work is the second point up here, which is, is, is really, I, I think there's still ex extremely useful um, things to be done analytically with this basic idea that came from geographers, which was to, to blow open the migration mobility's continuum uh, and take seriously how jets, jet states man manage it and generate power through bordering, making legible, making visible and invisible um, certain sorts of migrants, yes, the people that we focus on, the immigrants and the minorities that are often at the heart of our thinking, but also the massive numbers of people who are able to move across borders without there ever being any issue around it, i.e. tourists, business travellers, students, uh, nurses, all of the kind of categories that enable mobilities, the 99% in that sense, I mean, it is actually 99% if you look at Britain, um, there's 1% immigrants, 99% people moving across borders in terms of border crossings, not, not during COVID, but that's another story. Um, uh, and that, for me, is where this gets really interesting, how states maintain that kind of balance in the world of, of hypermobility, oiling the wheels of global capitalism at the same time as restricting and controlling migration in hugely symbolic ways in order to kind of generate sovereign power around bordering um, is to me the key way of unlocking still um, you know, th this question of political demography and, and the, the order of the world in which we live in. Live in. Um, and that, so that's mobility's work, and I, you know, I do this work with Ettore Recchi, and he has a thing called the Global, Global Mobilities Project in Florence, which is a nice complement, in fact, of Biao's project, I think, here at Max Planck, to also do a kind of mobilities, you know, kind of qualitatively driven mobilities framework of, of thinking about um, mobilities. Um, um, you could talk about the relationship of these things, and, and, and I think there's a common project, a common project here. So, um, yeah, maybe I could leave it at, at that. I mean, I, I'm happy to pick up on any of these sorts of issues, but as I say, I, I feel that what, a lot of what I'm doing here is simply rewording Nina's framework, um, but um, we might also focus on some of the differences and uh, contrasts that, that, that are out there. <laughs>